environment where what we call business and in many ways business has eroded our interpersonal skills at the expense of efficiency so we are always fast paced and really cannot stop for a moment to think to appreciate the other the default in healthcare is that we cannot choose our co-workers or patients. We are here to stay. Diversity is our reality. We must make it our strength. Because you know what? Rita is here to stay with my accent. And I love it in America. Part of my mission is to be gracious. What is yours? As citizens of this great country, we must understand what Martin Luther King Junior told us years ago. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly aff affects all indirectly. I would like to close with two things. First, when we feel a sense of belonging, it is not because we are the same as everyone else but because we have been accepted as we are. We don't have to be fake. We don't have to bring our performing self. We can be our authentic self. This Arab, Arab proverb best conveys the power of gracious space. And I'd like to read it. Hold the joy, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person or group, having neither to measure words not with thoughts, pouring them all out just as they are, shaft and grain together, setting a loving hand will sift through, keep with what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. I hope you've been transformed, and I hope this conference will transform you. Thank you for your time. At this point, I will be introducing the keynote address of our conference. And I'd like to tell you a little bit of the United States Deputy Surgeon General, Rear Admiral Silver Trent Adams. Silver Trent Adams is the nation Deputy Surgeon General. She served as the acting Surgeon General from April 21 to 17 to September 5 to 17. In her role as Deputy Surgeon General, Rear Admiral Silver Trent Adams advises and supports the Surgeon General regarding operations of the US Public Health Service Commission Cups and communicates the best available scientific information to advance the health of the nation. Rear Admiral Trent Adams has held various positions in the Department of Health and Human Services, working to improve access to care for poor and underserved communities. As a clinician and administrator, she has had direct impact on building systems of care to improve public health for marginalized population domestically and internationally. She served as the Chief Nurse Officer of the USPHS from November 2013 through May 2016. As a top-ranking public health official of the United States, Rear Admiral Trent Adams has been at the forefront of our nation's effort to combat and stem the spread of disease epidemics including the pandemics of deadly diseases such as Ebola. You all remember Ebola? Our community was at the forefront. Thank you. Influenza and HIV AIDS. She's known worldwide for her research, field work, and unmatched leadership to advance health through public health services. For example, in 2014, as the nation's commanding officer, she led the US effort 
to stem the spread of Ebola in the West Africa, African country of Liberia. A consummate leadership in the deployment of our military and public health personnel led to the successful eradication of Ebola from Liberia and many neighboring African countries in West Africa. Rear Admiral Trent Adam received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Aptin University, a Master of Science in Nursing and Health Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and a Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She became a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing in 2014. Rear Admiral Trent Adams reached the pinnacle of public health services through her selfless work as a career officer, an accomplished public health service leader, a prolific writer who is extensively published. She has authored dozens of research publications, public reports, and delivered numerous presentations nationally and internationally. Indeed, Rear Admiral Tr Silver Trent Adams is a gifted human. Those of us that had the honor of meeting and speaking with her yesterday, I, I think you witnessed that. A multi-talented leader, nurse leaders, and we are in the midst of greatness today because of some of the people and the work that you're doing. Keep doing the great work that you're doing and serving the people of Pennsylvania. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Dineran and her colleagues on the planning committee, her co-chair um, for Dr. Jones for the awesome planning of this event as well as a coordinated effort to bring so many great speakers to um, Drexel today to have a, a, a worthwhile conversation about culture, health, and the importance of diversity and inclusion. And I, there are a couple of things I have to do. You know, as, you know, as the co-chair, I know that you, you two have had a lot of work, but you've had some help. And I want to thank Sarah and um, Dr. Gitlin, Dr. Carey, and all the nurses who have supported this effort. Nur the Nurse Diversity Council, as well as the Pennsylvania Action Coalition, have done so much work, and this is not easy work to do. Because diversity is not something that's embraced by everyone, and in many places and spaces, it's not a comfortable conversation to have. So I applaud you for your efforts, and I hope that you will continue to have the, the um, success of having an yet another conference, but also to continue to have that collaboration at the, at the local level. You know, yesterday, <clears throat> Reverend, the Reverend Dr. Lorena Marshall Blake said during the reception, um, she was welcoming everyone to the sister of brotherly love, and is it sisterly action? Where is Dr. Affection, I love that. So I'm delighted to be here, and, and I've gotten a warm welcome from everyone that I've met. That's not always the case, because I don't always, always come with good news. <laughs> but. Over the course of my career, I've learned that one of the most important things to do when, you, when you're dealing with patients, dealing with difficult situations and, and populations who are underserved is to listen and to take heed to those things that are inherent in the communities that, you, that you're serving. There are so many things we take for granted and there are so many things that we need to stop just for, uh, just to pause for a moment to dissect and unpack the isms our pre preconceived notions and our beliefs and values need to be put in check before we start to engage and provide what is an assumption versus your authentic belief. So this morning, I want to talk to you about culture and health, specifically bridging the gap to improve outcomes for all. Because if we're all not progressing, if we're all not re achieving um, health outcomes that are beneficial to our communities, someone is being left out. And when one is being left out, we're all going to have a disservice. So first and foremost, I must say that I have no financial disclosures that would potentially con be a conflict of interest for this presentation. And um, in the words of my, my colleagues, you know, this is a great day and you all are mad and I hope that you'll continue to be mad. So 
um, what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk about a few things, and I'll try to be as quickly as quick as I can. I hope I have a few minutes for some questions, but I like to talk about this topic, so forgive me if I don't give you much time for questions. But I want to talk about the impact of culture and health outcomes, explore the role of policy in addressing social determinants of health, and identify ways that diversity and inclusion impacts clinical practice for each and every member of the healthcare team. So we're going to run through some definitions here. But first, I want to share, I love quotes. I know I have someone I heard last night who also loves quotes. But in the words of Gandhi, you must be the change that you want to see in the world. The world is, not, the world is changing, but the change is influenced by those of us who are in the world. So there are some change makers in the room, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to make the change that you have the effect and the opportunity to have purview over. So what is culture? Basically, it's a set of values, beliefs, attitudes, languages, symbols, and rituals and behaviors of a group of people, the customs that we share amongst our community. Diversity is a little different. Diversity, as Rita indicated, is the differences in racial and ethnic back, um, and socioeconomic and geographic and academic professional backgrounds. People are different. Each one of us brings something to the table. We also come with some baggage of our own. And it's important to understand that these make us different. It doesn't make us enemies. Now, inclusion. Now, to include means to bring things together, that we are more cohesive. But we bring, need to bring each other together in a way that it, the differences can be respected and serve the greater good and also be a catalyst for collaboration and change. Inclusion promotes an environment where everyone can feel respected and have some connection to the, the, to the outcome. Our shared ideas, our backgrounds and perspectives create a mutual benefit for all of us who are in the community. Now, cultural competency, and this is what I struggle with all the time because my colleagues say, well, that's not cultural competency. And we had these class standards that was developed at HHS in the, Depart and, um, in the Office of Minority Health several years ago. And, and, and I often have to take a step back because, as Rita indicated, she has an accent. I'm from rural Virginia, and when I go home, my accent comes back. I say y'all, I say ma, I say mommy, and it's amazing to me how my kids check me every once in a while and say, what are you talking about? And, I, and I, I go back in and out of it so easily, and one check for me is when I talk to my, when I used to talk to my great aunt, who's now at Rest Her Soul, she's gone on, she used to call and we would talk and I would immediately go back to being that 10 year old running around the house on the farm and, it, and I would go, Grand, um, auntie, yes did he? He said, and my kids are laughing. The language from my roots, the language from that space in my life is important to me and I hold that as a great value. And as we say, um, you know, been there, done that, but don't forget where you came from. So cultural competency is the effective use of social and interpersonal knowledge and skills that demonstrate an understanding, but also the appreciation of the individual. And I wanted my children to understand this. It's rich, there's a rich history associated with being from the country. There's nothing wrong with being from the country, because I know how to um, do a lot of things that they don't know how to do. I can plant to pay, to, um, to potatoes. I can plant tomatoes. I know when to plant, when to harvest. And um, there are things about the country like fresh air that are good for you that they really can't appreciate because they go into hysterics every time we cross that Virginia state line and go, when are we going home? There's no internet service at Granny's house. <laughs> yeah, culture of cultural competency. <laughs> but not only are we different, we also have similarities. But it's important for us to use data to, to empower us to understand where we are, where we're going, and where we need to transition in the healthcare delivery system. So our nation is changing. It is changing and it is changing, it has been changing for several years and it's now becoming a much richer, more diverse population. We see increases in different cultures in the United States and those cultures are more open than they were in the past. Baby boomers are the fastest growing segment of the US population. There's a, as Rita indicated, there's a shortage of geriatricians. There's a shortage of nursing home beds in many states. There's also um, this other population called the millennials. <laughs> love them, love them, love them, but bless their hearts. 
They are the largest generation in the United States labor force. And I work with a whole bunch of them. Got one right there beside me, which keeps me technically advanced, you know, and I, I say, okay, let's keep moving. But it's important for us to appreciate the wisdom of the baby boomers. We have a, we have a few other generations in there between, and you know, some of us are on the cusp of, of living in two worlds, you know, not really baby boomers and not really millennials. We get confused. I think they call us schizophrenic. But, <laughs> You know, there are days I love technology and there are days I too hate email, but it's all right because we have to appreciate those aspects of our culture and our, our environment to be able to develop a culturally appropriate workforce and work environment for the baby boomers as well as the millennials, as well as for gender-based and rural versus urban populations. One in five Americans live in a multi-generational household. And this was very commonplace when I was a kid but over the course of my life, I've seen, I saw a change. You did not see that as a cultural basis for most, for most Americans. Now we see a vast majority of communities seeing that on the rise. So as we become more multicultural as a society, according to the US Census Bureau, by 2040, no race will make up a majority. By 2050, US African American population will grow from 13% to 14%. The Hispanic population will go from 14 to 25. The Caucasian population is estimated to decrease from 74 to 50%. And the Asian population is estimated to increase from three to 8%. And this is what that looks like on a chart. So you can see that big bubble in the middle as things start to shrink and look at the age distribution. And we'll talk about workforce needs in, in a little bit later in, in my talk. But when you look, look, at, look at the projected population by 2050, you see here that the leveling off and the growth of the populations by 2050 over time, is, it includes a growth in every sector of this um, breakout of minority populations currently and a decrease in the white non-Hispanic population. And this is um, of the immigrant population, it is anticipated that the Asian population will be the largest immigrant population in the United States, surpassing Hispanics. So why is cultural diversity and healthcare an issue? Well, as we become more diverse, we become more, more um, focused on the needs of our communities as they're changing. It's important for us to stop again to take a pause because we're all different, but we're more alike than we are different. And another quote I wanted to share with you is from Nelson Mandela, that no one is born hating one another person based on the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. So what does that have to do with culture? And what does culture have to do with access, quality, and cost? Why is language relevant to the populations we serve? And is diversity really important in healthcare? Do we need to think about diversity as a part of our workforce, our programs? Well, let's, let's take a look at what's happening in the healthcare market overall. This table shows you um, a number and percent of un the uninsured. Up until 2014, we saw, and you know, we saw kept, the number of uninsured were rising and rising and rising. The affordable Care Act came into being in 2010. We had saw that we thought we saw the peak, and then we saw a rapid decline over leveling off over two or three years. And in 2015 and 2016, that continued to play out. But we saw a spike in 2017. Well, these numbers are level, have leveled off, but we know that there are subpopulations of our communities that continue to go without health insurance. But I want to look at something else here. What have we seen with pres prescription drug spending as a percentage of total gross, um, total growth in the national health care expenditures? And this is only through 2014. It actually continued to grow over 2015 and 2016. Now, part of this is attributed to, yes, overprescribing, but some of this is also increase in access, access to care also means increase in health care expenditures in some, in some ways. But if we don't look at 
the factors associated with cost and access and create models that are culturally representative of the communities. We cannot build sustainable models that are cost effective, high quality, and, uh, and accessible for communities that are underserved. And there's another factor associated with being able to reach communities, and that's language. We know that 14% um, four, of the US top population speaks a language other than English at home, and 54% of those speak Spanish. When we look at cultural diversity, there are so many factors that impact the world of diversity as it relates to not just race and ethnicity and language, but education, culture, geographic location. I think one of the biggest battles we've ever seen um, in many of the grant programs across the federal government is rural versus urban. There are many concerns that rural, the rural disproportionate share hospitals, the rural access hospitals were closing because of low census numbers, and if you don't have enough um, beds filled on a, on a given month or given day, then you lose your, you, you lose your um, grants. Well, there were no plans in place to figure out how to improve access for those rural communities. And what we learned was that rural, just because rural um, census rates are low, doesn't mean there's not a need for health care. Many are uninsured. Many cannot access the care that they need because of transportation, poverty, not even knowing that care is there, or not understanding the, how illness affects their body. And so as we start to look at cultural diversity in health care, rural versus urban, as a part of their geographic um, models of, of delivery, need to take into consideration how do we listen to that community to figure out, do you need urgent, more urgent care facilities? Do you need more community health nurses? Do you need a nurse practitioner versus having um, a series of, of um, urgent care visits into an emergency room or dock in the box, as they call them? I think they need more nurse managed clinics, but that's another, that's another day. Um, you know, I'm going to go off script here for a minute. I know I'll get in trouble, but anyway, um, I'm glad I'm retirement eligible. Uh, um, the, the one, one of the, the corollaries to some of the dynamics we see within our own profession is the way in which our practices is, is, is guided, regulated, and, and overseen at the state level. Well, you know, I was called to a meeting about infant mortality across the United States. And there were a couple of states that there was great concern about, Georgia being one of them. And so we listened to um, some of the infant mortality uh, statistics, maternal morbidity, maternal mortality. And I was blown away to hear this passionate plea from some of the healthcare uh, community, uh, specifically the physicians in the state of Georgia, and they were talking about what needed to be done. And I just listened, you know, communication, always listen first. You have two ears and one mouth. And what I was blown away to hear was that they hadn't connected the dots with the fact that nurse practitioners and midwives, Georgia's one of the most restrictive states as it relates to scope of practice. And there are other states who have recognized, specifically Tennessee has recognized the need to expand scope of practice, and Texas is getting there, slowly, but they're getting there, to looking at how every partner in the healthcare community can contribute to solving the problems that are most urgent and most concerning as it relates to the del delivery of health care, providing culturally diverse, high quality, and also cost-effective care. And we're seeing it play out in rural communities around the opioid epidemic. If you don't have social workers, if you don't have peer, peer counselors, if you don't have case managers, we will not get our hands around this opioid epidemic. But we have to have culturally diverse, populations of providers who are willing to go where no one wants to go. And last time I checked, I think they call them nurses? Okay. <laughs> now, cultural diversity is really important to all of us because as we look at the cultural, ethnic, and racial factors, they're drivers of healthcare beliefs and practices. If you don't stop long enough to hear what your patients have to say, you'll make a lot of mistakes. And I'll give you an example. I had this one patient who came um, to, the, to my, when I was practicing at Walter Reed, who came into the outpatient clinic, and she was emphatic that um, she wanted to stop taking her um, hypertension medications. And I said, well, why, honey? I need to please tell me what's going on. She's telling me all these great reasons that she should not take these hypertension medications anymore. And so I said, but no, you need to take your medication. You need to take your medication. 
Had I stopped to listen to her, she said, that I, would have, I would have missed this had I not had a very wise nurse um, practitioner say, you know, this woman's done a phenomenal job at weight loss. I hadn't even bothered to look at the other three chapters of her medical record to show me that when she was diagnosed with hypertension, she was 80 pounds heavier. She had received great advice and guidance from the dietitian. She had been going to a, um, an exercise expert who was helping her to lose the weight and, and, and improve her mobility. And she really felt that it was time for her to come off of her hypertension medication. So the nurse practitioner said, okay, we're gonna do a test here today. We're gonna talk to, the, we're gonna talk to her about what she's done, what she, what's going on in her body, and why she, feels so, why she feels differently about her medication now versus later, earlier in her, in her life. So she shared with me, she said, you know, I keep getting lightheaded. La la. And she said, I don't know why I'm sleeping so much. She's being over-medicated. And so that was a sentinel moment for me in my preceptorship that I learned it's so critical for, to not judge your patients, and just because it's written by another provider doesn't mean you need to keep on doing it. But stop and listen to your patients and figure out why they wanted to make these changes to their healthcare plan. And illness has a different perception. It's perceived differently by every single community. And so we need to be looking, we need to be very for, in the forefront of listening to patients, but understanding that culture has to be considered as a part of the healthcare delivery system. Healthcare providers must recognize the diverse characteristics of their patients. Now, I had a very motivated patient, which was not the norm for most of us in this particular clinic, because we would fight with patients to lose weight, they gain weight. We asked them to stop smoking, they smoke more. Um, and so my assumptions about the population that we served was clouding my ability to be a good provider. And so cultural diversity, um, you know, there's so many things that are happening right now as it relates to disability. Um, and people's ability to uh, seek the care that they need. We know that persons with physical and mental health challenges make up the largest minority of, in the U.S. population, 50 million. And I learned from talking to some of my partners at the Veterans Administration that a large percentage of this 50 million are veterans. They've served in uniform, they've given their lives um, for, the, 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 for the protection of our country, and they lack access to the crucial services that they, that they need desperately. Another 20, an estimated 25 million um, Americans identify as being gay, lesbian, or transgendered, and they're one of the highest populations to have lack of access and lack of quality of care. And according to the 2016 National Study on Drug Use and Health, about one in 10 people in the United States struggle with some level of substance use, including addiction to prescription drugs. As I said, the, opio the opioid epidemic is really bringing us to our knees in every community across the country. Seven out of 10 youth between the ages of 17 to 25 years of age cannot qualify for military service. Now, this is now being classified as a national security emergency by the National Security Council. The Surgeons Generals, Army, Navy, Air Force, and, and um, Dr. Adams, we've all been working together to identify some strategies on how to deal with obesity, mental health, and the lack of physical um, activity in our youth because this is a crisis. This means that about 70% of those, that population cannot be recruited for military service. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Um, but as we move through this next era of looking at um, who can serve and where they should serve, you'll see many things adapting to, to a, a dynamic that we never thought would happen. As you saw recently, the, the female combat pilots are being called on more frequently to fly missions. That would have never happened 20 years ago. It wouldn't happen 10 years ago. So as, as our needs change, culture is changing and adapting to the needs of our nation. So as a part of culture diversity in healthcare, we have to always consider the patient experience. And the family definition is different in every community and the role. Is it a matriarch or is it a patriarch? Um, language, how many languages do you speak? Do you speak a language at all? Or are you speaking a dialect that is unknown to anyone in your community? Personal space, now this is an important one, especially in the military. You know, personal space, some people can come up to you and they're two feet away, you backing up. In our patients, in, the, in, the, in our, in our um, healthcare facilities, we have to always respect their personal space. I mean, the Asian community, um, this is something that was brought to my attention 
um, eye contact in, 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 in the African community. So when we're tra I'm traveling all over the world, I have to always check my assumptions and values before engaging with the community because you can make a lot of diplomatic mistakes just by knowing where you are and what the rules of the game are. So rules of engagement, your body language and your gestures. You know, I know a lot of nurses and we're good for doing this. And it's not that we don't want to hear you, we, it's not that we've shut down, but that's what that means in some cultures. It's important for us to know that when we're dealing with our own healthcare beliefs and values and our religion and spirituality, food and dietary practices, and our views of birth, death, illness, and health, it, it affects the way we treat our patients. But we have to be open to our own isms before we're able to address those of our, of our um, patients. Now I want to um, highlight one example here, and I, I wanted to put a picture in here, but I struggled with counting these slides down. But there's a, there's a situation that, that happened with me in Liberia, and it really made me think long and hard about how I viewed life and death. Now, many of you are aware of um, during the Ebola outbreak that we had many people who were um, being infected because of burial practices. And there are practices in some of the tribes that you wash the bodies of, of your de other deceased family members before you bury them. And this was causing a rampant spread of disease amongst the community. Working with the WHO and the CDC, we were trying to educate the tribal leaders and working with the ministries of health of, of all the uh, uh, West African countries about the importance of maintaining the contaminants, so having safe burial practices. But this was a cultural change and it led to a lot of misunderstandings, and there are many situations whereby there were conflicts between the local community and um, these nations who were there to, to help with the epidemic. And I will tell you, these are some of the things that you often ponder late at night. Did I do the right thing? Did I listen? Did I listen to what the community had to say? And did my advice and my guidance help to stop disease, or did it create more angst with those that we're trying to serve? And those are, some, those are questions we have to ask ourselves every day, whether it's with substance abuse, whether it's with HIV or with Ebola. Um, it's important for us to check our isms and our own perspectives of values, and something as simple as honoring the dead, which we all do in all of our cultures, can be very different in different countries and in different communities. Now, I want to move on to social determinants of health. So the social determinants of health is something near and dear to me. My, my whole career has been primarily um, focused on combating social determinants of health. And these are complex, integrated, overlapping social structures. It is everything around us, everything we touch, everything we see, everything we feel, um, and everything from the social environment to the physical, the health services, the structural, and the societal factors. And you know, social determinants of health really do have an important role in improving health and reducing long-standing disparities in um, health and health care. If we can address social determinants of health at the root cause, then we can make some huge strides in being able to level the playing field for those who are underserved and marginalized in our country. So some of the key social determinants, and I won't read through this list, but I want to highlight um, poverty and educational attainment specifically, because those are two of the highest um, factors sir, in, in every community, if we know that educational attainment, as my mother used to tell me all the time, education is a great equalizer. And we were poor, rural, farming community, but she said to me, you will get an education. There was no will I, can I. There was no negotiating with that woman. I'm grateful for her perseverance and tenacity. I didn't appreciate it all the time. But one of the things that she was, she's absolutely, she's right about most, almost everything, 99.9%, .9%, except when her grandchildren go to her house and have to reprogram when they come home. She's not right about that. But <laughs> what she shared was insightful and it prepared me to understand the many communities that I have served over my career. And that is, poverty is real. I've done PO. And it's not comfortable. And it's difficult for people to acknowledge and it's difficult for them to talk about. It's one of those crucial conversations that in many communities people avoid. Poverty is real and it affects our youngest citizens, our youngest um, future members of society more than anyone else. And 
if we do not have healthy children who have food to eat, they can't learn. So they continue in that cycle of poverty and, and unemployment. But you know, I love this, this slide from the Kaiser Family Foundation because they talk about the many factors associated with social determinants of health and health outcomes. And if we look at those factors that we're always using as benchmarks for success, mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, functional limitations, if all these factors associated with the social determinants of health can give us a pipeline into just a little bit of insight into making some inroads in every community, I think we're on to something. But then there are inequities. There are inequalities and there are inequities. And the social determinants of health are mostly responsible, according to the WHO, for health inequities. The unfair and unavoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries, the structural roots of health and inequities lie within education, taxation, labor, and housing markets, urban planning, government regulation, healthcare systems, all of which are powerful determinants of health, and ones over which individuals have little or no direct personal control but can only be altered through social and economic policies and political processes. And that's where nurses come in. What's the largest licensed healthcare provider community in the, in the world? Nurses. And in the United States? Nurses. Okay. Policy change requires what? Voices. It requires us, our profession, to speak up, be at the table, and make the changes that need to be made. Now, the impact of different factors on the risk of premature death. As you can see here, behavioral health is one of the biggest components. But we take for granted that in the social um, determinants of health, that if we don't have safe drinking water, Flint, Michigan, if we don't have um, you know, conditions whereby you can control infectious disease, Zika, um, if we don't have communities that are responsive to um, those, those isms, those um, poor uh, school systems, Detroit, we will have these cycles of poverty and underachievement by the future generation and a decline of health and life expectancy for the elderly. Now, talk about education. And this slide shows you that more education, longer life. And you know the, the Commission on Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did a lot of research on, well, if education and health care, are they really connected? Absolutely. Because if you are able to obtain a high school diploma, you're more likely to be employed. If you're employed, you're more likely to have health insurance. If you have health insurance, you're more likely to have access to health care. If you have access to health care, you're more likely to have a longer lifespan. So that we're all interconnected. But as I said, the great equalizer. And being able to speak truth to power is important because so many factors that are right within our reach, we lack the initiative in some cases to make that um, change to the systems. And as I said, children raised in poverty, uh, I won't go through this again, but have lower levels of educational attainment. They are more likely to score lower on standardized tests and we know that having, you know, having lower earnings or more children who have um, lower raised in poverty are also more likely to have not finished high school and have lower earnings and therefore are likely to live in poverty as adults. The social determinants of health um, and you know, in, looking at the increase in the number of, of initiatives to address social determinants of health helps us to think outside of the healthcare delivery system because er healthcare is everything. Housing is healthcare. Um, working with the homeless uh, HIV-infected population, I will never forget we had a homeless um, gentleman who was diabetic. And I, was, and I looked at one of the nurse practitioners and I said, you know, the doctor wrote this prescription for insulin. Does he know he's homeless? She says, I doubt it. So we're running around trying to make sure as, as a case manager, I said, um, I think you made a mistake here. He says, no, he needs to be on insulin. And he needs to be checking his blood sugar at least three times a day and uh, four times a day. And then he needs, and I said, he's on sliding scale. I said, sir, he's homeless. And he says, uh-huh. I said, he doesn't have a refrigerator. And it was like this light bulb goes off in his head. And he said, wow. And I will never forget the aha moment of the team who was working with him that they had. And it's not, I won't say it's the doctor's fault. It was the fact that the, the collaboration 
and sharing of information hadn't gotten to the right person to make decisions about what's appropriate care for this individual in their current living situation. So ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And then developing policies and practices in, in non-health sectors to promote health and health equity. You know, I am very proud of the fact that in the state of Maryland, we're looking at, um, Governor Hogan has said that every child um, in the state of Maryland who lives in a household with an income less than $125,000 a year will be able to go to community college for free. That's amazing. Now, um, does this have anything to do with health or health care? Absolutely. Well, first of all, they have a lot of folks who can go to feeder programs, get into nursing school. That's one. But it provides individuals with an opportunity to improve their education, have a longer life expectancy, and be able to have a sustainable um, income. And then there's that multi-payer federal and state initiatives um, that plays a big role in how we're able to reach communities that are often marginalized and underserved. These public-private partnerships are critical um, I want to you know, highlight what Kaiser's been doing with the Boys and Girls Club, what many of the um, nonprofit organizations have been doing through their public donations with schools. It's phenomenal what we can do in communities that are underserved when we just think outside of the box. And it's not just about free lunches and, and, and having day camps. It's about having a holistic view of the, of the, of the individual that will benefit the entire community as, as, a, as a whole. So I know I'm running out of time, so I just want to talk quickly about um, models to address culture and diversity in healthcare. Again, I want to highlight one of my heroes, um, um, Wayne Dyer. And I, I love reading a lot of his work because it makes you think. Um, and he said, if you can change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And second, when you judge another, you do not define them, you define yourself. And that's so true in many cases, because just as a caterpillar thought he was at the end, he became a butterfly. And as we see the U.S. population change, there will be challenges, but there are also opportunities. There are opportunities for us to address our increasing diversity by looking at how do we respond and have a better solution for de delivering care to this population. And a lot of it starts with our own, in our own camp. So I want you to take this slide and look at this as it relates to diversity of our country going forward. Currently, in the United States, 83% of the nursing population is, as of 2015, is white, non-Hispanic. 5% African American, 6% Asian, and 4% Hispanic. And we have a small 2% of American Indian Alaska Native of two or more races. Now, according to the US Census Bureau, individuals from ethnic and racial minority groups accounted for more than one third of the US population in 2012. With projections pointing to minority populations becoming the majority by 2043, professional nurses must demonstrate a sensitivity to an understanding of a variety of cultures to provide high quality care across the settings. Now, one of the things that are in the RWJ, um, the future of nursing, they talked about a lot of important factors as it relates to improving quality of care. One of the hallmarks of quality is understanding your patient and respecting their culture and their diversity. And the best way to understand culture is to, to explore your own. So I wanted to pause for a moment and ask you, what holidays or celebrations do you hold important to yourself and your family? And think about why. Now, how would you feel if you were told one day that you would no longer be able to or be allowed to celebrate those holidays or those celebrations? And think about how you grew up, where you grew up, and how did that influence your view of the world? And how does your gender shape your aspirations in life? The stereotypes, the isms, and the prejudice that abound in our society often limit people from achieving their best. It, it doesn't allow great to become greater and amazing to even be born. But a lot of this is because of fear. And Florence Nightingale says that, she said, how very little can be done under the spirit of fear. So what will it take? It takes a lot, but I think we can do it.
It requires that we have leadership and commitment to support and promote diversity at all levels of an organization, not just at the bedside, not just in the clinic, but at every level of the organization. The C-suite must understand and value and promote diversity. There needs to be a constant needs assessment and data collection and ongoing feedback as to the workforce diversity and the community that we serve. Strategic planning with meaningful input from stakeholders. From stakeholders, I mean employees, also the community, the patients. And, mission, and a mission statement and policies that reflect the values and principles of diversity, as well as inclusion. And an effort, a significant effort, to recruit and retain diverse staff and have targeted service delivery standards based on the needs of the community, reflected by the data and can be supported by the mission statement. Now, diversity is a puzzle, but it's all connected. And it's connected in so many different ways across many factors of our lives. And as I close today, I have a few take home messages. We all have a role to play. And there's so much that we can all do. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to serving culturally diverse populations. Culture is relative. It is indeed learned. It is collective. It changes over time. And it is very complex. This is hard work, but it's worth it. You know, as nurses, we know a lot, but we don't know everything. And we know that the social determinants of health are huge drivers in access, quality, and cost. Social determinants of health have a direct impact on health, health care, life expectancy, and overall well-being. Education, occupation, income, and assets, socioeconomic status are all major de determinants of health. Children are especially vulnerable to the negative effects of poverty. And nurses, we are the most trusted profession in the country. People rely on us for advice and guidance. And the communities where we live can be a huge opportunity for us to build on that trust and provide our guidance. And we can be the change agents to improve the health of our nation. And I want to leave you with a quote from Martin Luther King. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. My colleagues, as we go into challenging times and we start to face the controversy of the many isms, the diversity of our communities, as we face the opioid epidemic, the obesity epidemic, and national security threats, I hope that you will understand your role and the importance of your voice in creating change and creating a healthier, safer nation, but also embracing the cultural diversity and the importance of everyone having a voice. Thank you, and I Godspeed. Could have added. And Rita, I want to thank you very much again for that 